Good morning, MAB Elementary. This is Mr. T for our literature group. We're reading that wonderful story, The Incredible Journey, and I'm here in our classroom uh, to bring you up to date on what happens in Chapter 6. But first of all, I'm going to show you the illustration that I didn't show you last week on chapter at the beginning of Chapter 5 because it tells you about the exciting and very difficult situation that developed. And you can see here that our friend the cat has been washed down the river uh, in that flood uh, and the dogs tried to rescue him uh, and so far they haven't succeeded. And they proceeded on their way uh, westward again, having crossed the river successfully at great danger uh, and they're now moving on without the cat. So let's pick up the story on chapter six. Many miles downstream, on the side to which the dogs had crossed, a small cabin stood near a bank of the river, surrounded by three or four acres of cleared land. Its solid, uncompromising appearance lightened only by the scarlet geraniums at the window sills and a bright blue door. Oh, my goodness. Author Sheila Burnford, her ability to write descriptive paragraphs and sentences is amazing. Let me read that one to you. Close your eyes and listen to the description and see if you can see the scene she is describing in words. Many miles downstream on the side to which the dogs had crossed, comma, a small cabin stood near a bank on, uh, of the river, comma, surrounded by three or four acres of cleared land, comma, its solid, comma, uncompromising appearance, lightened only by the scarlet geraniums at the windowsills and a bright blue door. That's all one complex sentence. Amazing what authors like Miss Burnford can write. How creatively. The imagination it takes for her to sit at a typewriter and put those words down on paper so you and I and our brains can go right to the middle of the Canadian dense forest and see this cabin out in the woods. That's what you call talent. And that's what makes classics that we read in literature popular generation after generation. So I just did that little pause to give you some background on what kind of a fabulous book we're reading here. <clears throat> a log barn stood back from it and a steam bathhouse at the side near the river. The patch of vegetable garden, the young orchard, and the neatly fenced fields, each with their piles of cleared boulders and stumps, were small, orderly miracles of victory, won from the dark, encroaching forests that surrounded them. They're isolated, aren't they? <clears throat> Rhino Nurmi and his wife lived here, as sturdy and uncompromising as the cabin they had built with their own hand-hewn logs, their lives as frugal and orderly as the fields that they had wrested from the wilderness. Hand hues means that they cut down trees with axes and built their houses. <clears throat> they had tamed the bush, and in return it yielded them their food and their scant living from trap lines and, and a wood lot, but the struggle to keep it in, sub, in, subjugation, in sub, subjection was endless. <clears throat> they had retained their Finnish identity, they were from Finland, <clears throat> complete when they left their homeland, exchanging only one country's set of solitudes and vast lonely forests for another. And as yet, <clears throat> their only real contact with the new world that lay beyond their property line was through their 10-year-old daughter, Helvi, who knew no other homeland. Helvi walked the lonely miles to the waiting school bus each day and through, and through her, they strengthened their roots in the security of the new world of Canada and were content, meanwhile, with the horizons limited by their labor. <clears throat> on Sunday afternoons that the beaver dam, on the Sunday afternoon that the beaver dam broke, a day of some relaxation, Helvey was down by the river, skipping flat stones across the water and wishing she had a companion. For she found it difficult to be entirely fair in a competition always held against herself. She lived alone, out in the wilderness with just her parents. 
The riverbank was steep and high here, so, so she was quite safe when a rushing torrent of water held by a great curling wave swept past. She stood watching it, fascinated by the spectacle, thinking that she must go and tell her father when her eyes were caught by a piece of debris that had been whirling around in a black eddy and was now caught on some boulders at the edge of the bank. Hmm. She could see what looked like a small, limp body on the surface. She ran along by the boiling water to investigate, scrambling down the bank to stand looking pitifully, pity, pityingly, at the wet, bedraggled body and wondering what it was, for she had never seen anything like it before. She dragged the mass of twigs and branches <clears throat> further up the land and then ran to call her mother. Miss Narumi was out in the yard and by an old wood stove which she used for boiling the vegetable dyes for her weaving or, peeling and <clears throat> or peelings and scrapes for the hens. She followed Helvey, followed Helvey, called out to her husband to come and see the strange animal washed up by an unfamiliar swift surging river. Now, my apologies. Some guy is out here with his leaf blower blowing grass that doesn't need to be blown. Uh, and it's unfortunate, and I hope you can't hear it, and it doesn't disrupt too much uh, of, uh, of our reading and our concentration on the story. But it's noise pollution, and it's kind of aggravating and unnecessary, in my opinion. That's a political comment. We'll continue. So, uh, Helvey called mom and dad to come run and see what she found in the swift surging river. He came and with his unhurried countryman's walk and quiet, thoughtful face, and joined the others to look down in silence in <clears throat> at the small, limp body, the dark, darkly plastered fur betraying its slightness the frail skull bones and thin crook tail mercilessly exposed. Suddenly he bent down and lay his hand lightly on it for a moment, then pulled back the skin above and blow one eye and looked more closely. He turned and saw Helby's anxious questioning face close to his own, and beyond that her mother's. Is a drowned cat worth trying to save? He asked them, and when her mother nodded before Helby's pleading eyes, he said no more, but scooped the soaking bundle up and walked back to the cabin, telling Helby to run ahead and bring some dry sacks. Oh my, what a luck for our kitty cat. He laid the cat down in a sunny patch by the wood stove and rubbed it vigorously with sacking, turning the body from side to side until its fur stood out in every direction and it looked like some disheveled old scarf. Then, as he wrapped the sack, <clears throat> sacking firmly around and her mother pried the clenched teeth open, Helby poured a little warm milk and precious brandy down the pale, co pale cold throat. <clears throat> she watched <clears throat> as a spasm ran through the body, followed by a faint cough, then held her breath in sympathy as the cat retched and choked convulsively, a thin dripple of milk appearing by the side of its mouth. Rhino laid the strained body over his knee and pressed gently over the ribcage. The cat choked and struggled for breath until at last a sudden gush of water streamed out and it lay relaxed. Rhino gave a slow smile of satisfaction and handed the bundle of sacking to Helvey, telling her to keep it warm and quiet for a while if she was sure that she still wanted a cat. You think she wants the cat? She felt the open, <clears throat> she felt the oven still warm, though the fire had long died out, and then placed the cat on a tray inside, leaving the door open. When her mother went into the cabin to prepare supper and Rhino left to milk the cow, Calvi sat cross-legged on the ground by the stove, anxious, anxiously chewing the end of one fair braid, watching and waiting. Every now and then she would put a hand into the oven to touch the cat, to loosen the sack or to stroke its soft fur, which was beginning to pulsate with life under her fingers. After half an hour, she was rewarded. The cat opened his eyes. She leaned over and looked closely into them, their blackness now con con contract contracted slowly <clears throat> to pinpoints, and a pair of astonishingly vivid blue eyes looked up at her instead. It's a Siamese cat. Presently, under her gentle stroking, she felt a throaty vibration, then heard a rusty, feeble purring. Widely excited, she called her parents, purring kitty cat. 
Within another half an hour, the little Finnish girl held in her lap a sleek, purring Siamese cat who had already finished two saucers of milk, which normally he detested, drinking only water, <coughs> and who had groomed himself from head to foot. By the time the Numeri family was eating their supper around the scrubbed pine table, he had finished a bowl of chopped meat and was weaving his way around the table legs, begging in his plaintive, odd voice for more food, his eyes crossed intently, his kink tail held straight in the air like a banner. Helvy was fascinated by him and by his gentleness when she picked him up. That night, the Nurins were having <clears throat> fresh pickerel <clears throat> cooked in the old country way with the head still on and surrounded by potatoes. Pickerel is a freshwater fish you'd catch in lakes uh, in Canada. Helvy ladled the head with some broth and potatoes into a saucer and put it on the floor. Soon the fish head had disappeared to the accompaniment of pleasing rumbling growls. The potatoes followed, then holding down the plate with his jaw, the cat polished it clean with his tongue. Satisfied at last, he stretched superbly, his front paws extending so that he looked like a heraldic lion, then jumped onto Helby's lap, curled himself around, and purred loudly. This cat knows how to make friends. The parrot's acceptance was completed by this action, though they, they had never before been a time or a place in, their, in the economy of their lives for an animal which did not earn its keep or lived el anywhere else except the barn or the kennel. For the first time in her life, Helby had a pet, a pet. It's important to know, these are subsistence farmers out in the middle of nowhere. And so everything they do uh, has to contribute to their living, uh, to their the basic needs that they have as human beings for shelter. We know the uh, basic needs of human beings uh, being uh, uh, shelter, the material needs being shelter and food and transportation. Well, all the animals in their lives had to have some kind of a contribution, a material contribution to their material human needs. And pets don't. Pets contribute to your spiritual needs, your feeling of well-being, your feeling of love, your feeling of empathy. Uh, and so that's why pets really are a luxury for humans who have their material needs taken care of. And that's something to think about if you have a pet uh, and how fortunate you are to be grateful for being able to have a pet uh, like uh, this wonderful kitty cat uh, because the kitty cat doesn't earn his keep in a material way, but the kitty cat earns his keep in a spiritual way, in an emotional way. My kitty cats do for me, I promise you. Continuing our story. Helvy carried the cat up to the bed with her, and he draped himself with familiar ease over her shoulder as she climbed the steep ladder stairs leading up to her little room in the eaves. So she lives up in kind of a, a mezzanine <clears throat> in the roof where they built her bed. She tucked him tenderly into an old wooden cradle, and he lay in sleepy contentment, his dark face incongruous against a doll's pillow. Incongruous is, a, um, is an adjective, is an adverb, it's an adverb, and it means uh, it looked really strange. Uh, it looked out of place. There's a cat's face next to a, 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 a doll's human-like face. Late in the night, she woke to a loud purring in her ear and felt him treading a circle at her back. The wind blew a gust of cold rain across her face, and she leaned over to shut the window hearing far away, so faint that it died in the second of the wind-borne sound, the thin, high kneading of a wolf. Kneading is the howling. She shivered as she lay down, then drew the, the new comforting warmth of the cat closely to her. Hmm. Miss Beaufort is suggesting something here, maybe. She heard the keening of a wolf. You think it was a wolf? Hmm, we'll see. When Helby left in the morning for the long walk and ride to the distant school, the cat lay curled on the window windowsill among the geraniums. He had eaten a large plate of oatmeal and his coat sh shone in the sun as he licked it sleepily, his eyes following Miss, Mrs. Numery as she moved about the cabin. 
But when she went outside with a basket of washing, she looked back to see him standing on his hind legs, peering after, his silent mouth opening and shutting behind the window. She hurried back, fearful of her geraniums, and opened the door, at which he was already scratching, half expecting him to run. Instead, he followed her to the washing line and sat by the basket, just purring. He followed her back and forth between the cabin and the wood stove, the hen house and the stable. When she shut him, <clears throat> when she shut him out once by mistake, he wailed pitifully. Hmm. This is the pattern of his behavior all day. He shouted the Nurmis <clears throat> as they went about their chores, appearing silently at some point of vantage. The seat of the harrow, a sack of potatoes, the manger or the well platform, his eyes on them constantly. This is a smart cat, and he knows that humans are his salvation out in the wilderness. Hmm. Mrs. Nurmi <clears throat> was touched <clears throat> by this apparent need for companionship. That's what it is. That his behavior was unlike that of any other cat she attributed to his foreign appearance. But her husband was not so easily deceived. He had noticed the usual intense, the unusual intensity of the blue eyes. When a passing raven mocked the cat's voice, he did not look up. Then later <clears throat> sat unheeding in the stable to a quick rustle in the straw behind. Rhino knew that that cat was deaf. Whoa. Carrying his school book and <clears throat> lunch pail, Helvey ran most of the way back across the fields and picked up the cat as well <clears throat> when, he had, when he came to meet her. He, <clears throat> he clung to her shoulder, balancing easily while she performed the routine evening chores that awaited her. Undetoured by his weight, <clears throat> she fed the hens, gathered the eggs, fetched the water, then sat <clears throat> at the table stirring dried mushrooms. <clears throat> List all the chores Helvey had <clears throat> when she came home from the long school bus ride. Gathered eggs, fetched the water from the house, <clears throat> <clears throat> fed the chickens, the hens, and sat at, the <clears throat> sat at the table stringing dried mushrooms. She must be, I guess she's putting them onto a string with a needle so they can be hung to dry. <clears throat> When she put him down <clears throat> before supper, she saw that her father was right. The pointed ears did not respond to any sound, though he noticed that <clears throat> he started and turned his head at the vibration if she clapped her hands or dropped even a small pebble on the bare floor. So the cat's sense of, um, of feeling of uh, any kind of movement, emotion, or, or vibration is keen, but his hearing is gone. She had brought home two books from the traveling library, traveling library. So in rural schools, uh, in countries uh, where, out in the countryside where there's no library, uh, a, a bus or a van will come by and it'll have uh, library books in it that the kids can take out, which is pretty cool. And then the truck, uh, the library, the mobile library comes by once a week and you return the books that you took out and you get some new ones. So it's a great way <clears throat> for kids to get to be able, and adults to get to be able to read books, even though they live out in the country. <clears throat> she, had, <clears throat> she had brought home two books from the traveling library. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I apologize for the hay fever. The pollen is bad. <clears throat> and after supper, <clears throat> after supper dishes had been cleared away, her parents sat by the, sat, sat by the stove in a short interval before bed while she read aloud to them, translating as she went. Ah, so she speaks and reads English, and her parents read and speak Finnish because they're immigrants from Finland. Wow. So she read the story, the books, and she translated them into Finnish. They sat in their moment of rare relaxation <clears throat> because they work all the time to keep their form uh, uh, going. They sat in their moment of rare relaxation with the cat stretched out on his back feet, <clears throat> on his back at their feet, and the child's soft voice flowing through the dark austerity of the cabin carried them beyond the circle of light from the oil lamp to the warmth and brightness of the strange lands. Oil lamp. 
So way out in the country, there is no electricity. There's no electrical power plants that can connect wires to the house and power electric lights and heaters and things like that. So she has to read, as the sun goes down, by an oil lamp, a lamp that burns coal oil, kerosene. Wow. They heard of seafaring Siamese cats who worked their passage the world over. Their small hammocks made and slung by their human messmates who held them second to none as ship's cats and of, and of the great proud Siamese ratting corps who patrolled the dock, dockyards in Le Havre, France with unceasing vigilance. They saw with their eyes withdrawn and dreaming the palace watch cats of long ago Siam in Asia where the Siamese cats originated, walking del delicately on long simian legs around the fountain courtyards, their softly padded feet polishing the mosaics to a luster path of centuries. And at last they, leaned, they learned how these noble-born Siamese acquired the kink in the end of their tails and bequeathed it to all their descendants. So, Helge, Helvi had picked up a book from the traveling library about the history of Siamese cats. Pretty cool. As they listened, they looked down in wonder, for there on the rug lay one of these, stretched out flat on his royal back, his illustrious tail twitching idly, and his jeweled eyes on their daughter's hand as she turned the pages that stroked his ancestors, spoke of his ancestors, the guardian cats of the Siamese princesses. Each princess, when she came down to bathe in the palace lake, would slip her rings for safekeeping on the tail of her attendant cat. So zealous in their charge were these proud cats that they bent the last joint sideways for safer custody, and in time their faithful tails became choked forever, and their children and their children in their children and their children's children's tails. So that's the legend of how the crook and the uh, Siamese cat's tail came from protecting the rings of the princesses while they bathed. Interesting legend. One after another, the Nurmis passed their hands admiringly down the tail before them to feel the truth in that bent bony tip. Then Helby gave him a bowl of milk, which he drank with regal condescension before she carried him up the ladder to bed. That night, and for one more, the cat lay curled peacefully in Helby's arm, and in the daytime, during her absence, he followed her parents everywhere. Now, you remember we have always talked about when you're reading great books like this, you got to watch for the author to give you signals that something is about to happen. Let me read that again and see if you can pick out the signal. That night, and for once more, the cat lay curled peacefully in Helby's arms, and in the daytime, during her absence, he followed her parents everywhere. He trailed through the bush after her mother as she searched for the late mushrooms, and then sat on the cabin steps and patted the dropped corn kernels as she shucked the stack of cobs. He followed Rhino and his workhorse across the fields to the wood lot and perched on a newly felled pungent stump, his head following their every movement and he curled by the door of the stable and watched a man mending harnesses and oiling traps. And he lay, <clears throat> lay late afternoon when Helby returned. He was, he, was, he was there waiting for her, a rare and beautiful enigma in the certain routine of the day. He was one of them, their family. An enigma, enigma means a riddle, something that's hard to figure out, something that's kind of out of place. So this cat was out of place in their lives, wasn't he? But, hmm, but, great conjunction that tells you to beware. <laughs> but on the fourth night, he was restless, restless, shaking his head and pawing his ears, his voice distressed at her back. At last, he lay down, purring loudly, and pushed his head into her hand. The fur below his ears was soaking. Hmm. She saw their sharp black triangles outlined against the little square of the window, and she watched them flicker and quiver in response to ever, every small night sound. Glad for him and his newfound f hearing, she fell asleep. So it turns out that his ears were full of water, 
from his almost drowning and that water drained and he could listen out the window for the sounds of the night. Hmm, what do you think that's going to lead to? Let's see. When she woke later in the night, aware of the lost warmth, she saw him crouched at the open window, looking out over the pale fields and the tall, dark trees below. His long, sinuously tail, sinuous tail thrashed to and fro as he measured the distance to the ground. Even as her hand moved out impulsively towards him, he sprang, landing with a soft thud. She looked down and saw his head turn for the first time to her voice, his eyes like glowing rubies as they caught the moonlight and then turned away. And with a sudden desolate knowledge, she knew that he had no further need for her. Through the blur of the tears, she watched him go, stealing like a wrath in the night towards the river that had brought him. Soon the low, swiftly running form was lost among the shadows. And I'll show you the illustration from the start of the chapter. So, be thinking about what happens in chapter seven. Our story continues with more excitement and drama as a good story would. This is Mr. T for Literature Group, signing out.